I invite you to open with me to the last verse of chapter 20 of the Gospel by John. Chapter 20, John's Gospel, 31st verse. We're going to spend our entire time looking at the ramifications of that verse. The question I wish to ask you from our Master's Message series, which we're beginning this morning in the Gospel by John, chapter 20 and verse 31, is, do you believe and live? the message of this gospel life that's contained. Do you believe and have the life? Look at what it says in verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Seventy-nine times John says, believe and believe. He says, I want you to believe and hold to this message. And when you do, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And when you believe that, you have Life, life in his name, life the way it was meant to be, life the way God designed it to be, life that is unbelievable, overwhelming, and divine. Now, the question is, uh, are we supposed to still preach the same gospel? Because in our generation, it's being reexamined whether we're supposed to preach this old-fashioned gospel that Christ and the apostles preached. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, there are a lot of people that have studied, and they've said, well, well, You know, we don't want to be offensive. We've got to change the hymns and get all this sin and worm stuff out. We've got to change the the whole translation of the Bible to not offend people with this, you know, God being a male kind of figure. And and we want to get rid of these gender-specific roles of elders being men. And, and, you know, we, we just got to not offend people anymore. And then they back up even on the gospel presentation, and they don't really confront people with the gospel till far into the ministries of many churches. Well... Does the gospel still contain the power of God unto salvation? I just want to take a moment with you this morning and introduce you to one of my heroes. Go back 70 years in time, and his name is Charles T. Studd. And When he was 22 years old in the year 1880, he was a professional athlete in London and a multimillionaire. He was a multimillionaire in 1880, back when a million dollars meant something. I mean, nowadays, people can have million-dollar houses and be outer paupers. He had millions of dollars. His estate was so large uh, that it was in the square miles, and he lived in a castle. So, I mean, we're talking about a really wealthy professional athlete and businessman. But this man, at the age of 22, was confronted with the gospel. Straight, plain, you're lost, you're a sinner, Christ is your only hope, you will have an empty, hopeless life apart from him. And he responded to the old-fashioned gospel. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, what happened to him, because modern history testifies to what will happen to those who hear the Bible preached. An illustration of this is 70 years ago, a living legend named C.T. Studd. This man, after he was converted, moved to China, where he worked for 15 years preaching the gospel. He went on for six years to India. And finally, after 21 years, he says, all these people have heard about the gospel. In China, uh, after Hudson Taylor had been there all those years, and in India, after William Carey, he says, Give me, he said to the London Mission Board, give me an assignment where people have never heard the gospel. He says, I want to, this China and India stuff, 21 years, he says, they're already, they heard it. Give me some place they haven't heard. So he said, well, there is one spot. It's called the White Man's Graveyard. It's in the very heart of Africa. If you look at a map of Africa, hit the dead center. They said it's a torrential rainforest where the light of the sun never penetrates to the floor of the jungle. It's where the light of civilization, the gospel, or even humanity has never penetrated to the hearts of those pygmy, savages, cannibals, utterly wicked, immoral, and murderous people. They said, you want to go there? We don't usually have anybody last more than six months. He said, I'd like to go there. And after 21 years in India and China, he spent his last 21 years on earth alive in the heart of Africa. His last week of life was 5,000 of his personal converts he'd led to Christ. In July of 1931, he was confined to a cot. He was so sick, so emaciated, he had an inoperable gallstone. Uh, He had had it for 15 years, and it grew bigger and bigger, and he had constant terrible seizures and fevers and and horrible pain and everything that's associated with it. But he never stopped because if he went to England and they did the surgery, they'd say he's too weak to come back. So he said, I'd rather stay here and suffer. And he led to the Lord in 21 years 5,000 of these folks. What kind of folks were they? Well, before him sat men and women whose bodies were the habitation 
before Christ of foul, dark fiends from the pit. And now those people sat in front of him as living temples of the Holy Spirit of God. Once they were naked and grossly immoral, lovers of darkness. Now they were not only clothed in Christ, but they were modestly clothed in the clothing of the jungle. They would sew together banana leaves and wear that because they realized the need before holy God to be a modest individual. Once they lived as a continuation of generation after generation of murder, Years of darkness, lives of savagery, but now they sat in front of their beloved father in the faith in an immense sea of white tooth smiles. These people, by the way, they would sit there, and he had tra- this man, C.T. Studd, Charles T. Studd, had translated into the language of the pygmies of the heart of Africa and the Congo in 1931. He had translated the English hymns, and he taught them one line at a time. Now, this is no books. No radio, no anything. I mean, these people just had their banana leaves and their spear, and they lived in the jungle. I mean, they came and sat. He taught them the great hymns that we sing. One of their favorites was, Wounded for me, wounded for me. There on the cross, he was wounded for me. Gone my transgressions, now I can sing. And they would sing before he spoke for two hours. Two hours before he could speak. And then they'd tilt his cot up so he could see them. And he was kind of strapped to the cot. And they'd tilt him up like this so he could see him. And he would hold his Bible. Now, he had a very interesting philosophy of ministry. He would get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. They would make his fire. They'd stir it up, put more wood on it so he could see. He'd tip his Bible. And he would read pages after pages for a couple hours till he found truths from God's Word. And then they'd tip him up in his cot. And all these thousands would come. And he'd tell them what the Bible said. No techniques, no super sophisticated methodology, just the preaching of the word of God. These people once were all mortal enemies. They would kill and eat one another. They collected body parts that they would dry and hang from their their little huts in the in the wild jungle there to show how many they had of their enemies they had eaten and kept a piece of them to show. But now, with no weapons of war left, Only bound together by the bonds of love, those thousands sat with their faces turned heavenward. Former enemies, now shoulder to shoulder, singing of the beautiful shore where they would someday sit. Well, those congregation of saints were converted and transformed by the Lord through the simple, passionate preaching by Charles T. Studd of the truth of God's word in the Bible. That's why all believers throughout all the ages have seen lives transformed by the preaching of the gospel. They simply obeyed what Jesus left them and us to do.